not over. I'm not going to say that all over. <laughs> But anyway, but so so we've been at this for a number of months, um, really trying to come up with strategies to improve safety for anybody that's biking or walking, you know, in this area. Ironically, coming in today, really nice day, a lot of people walking around. And, and quite frankly, walking up the hill from sort of the downtown area up to the commercial core where there really aren't any facilities. So, you know, I think there's certainly a need for doing something and was very evident, evident today. With me is Mitch, Mitch Racer. He's a, a landscape urban designer um, on the team, um, helping to sort of you know develop a lot of the, um, I'll say streetscape urban elements of what we've come up with. These meetings are really important in terms of coming up with you know consensus-based recommendations. And so we take comments very seriously. Um, you you know this quarter better better than anybody. You know, Mitch and I have been up here a little bit, but you guys live it day in day out, and so we really we you know we want to listen to you and 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 gain your feedback. And so a bulk of it will be listening to you in terms of item number five, public public input comments. It's about a twenty minute minute I'll say presentation. It's not overly long, um, and we'll so we'll walk through those items um, um, as we go along. Um, Really great sort of steering committee. We call you know study advisory committee that helps sort of guide the process um, as we moved along from the beginning, sort of the kickoff of the study to where we're at now. Host of town staff, outdoor sports institute, main DOT staff, and then a number of other people that are involved, and then certainly part of the Ty Lynn and Mitch Mitch team. And so. One of, the, one of the first things that we generally craft as part of doing a study like this, and again, this is a planning study. There's, there's, no, there's not a design that's being done. Um, those hopefully will be something, something that would happen in the future. We set something called a purpose and need statement. I'm not gonna read this whole thing, but fundamentally I'll, I'll, I'll talk about little pieces of it. It's about promoting safe, convenient and attractive pedestrian and bicycle transportation facilities. So really looking at sidewalks, crosswalks, maybe bike lanes, and I'll talk about some of the, some of the um, elements of, of how to improve it. Thinking about you know, supporting you know, independent mobility for everybody. You know, so so whether, whether you're visually impaired or have mobility constraints or you're young or you're old, um, really it's thinking about how do we come up with a system that works for everybody that's basically you know, in the community and, um, and, 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 and um, and, and wants to sort of engage the outdoor, outdoor environment. And then really thinking about, you know, promoting this, this improved system as part of creating a he healthy lifestyle um, so people can become active and encourage people to get out. One thing we do know is that and even, though, and even though I saw people out there today, um, which is great, if you improve the infrastructure, you'll see more people. You know, it's sort of the, 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 the theory, you build it, people will come. And so that's the case you know, with, with building good bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. I keep hitting space bar and it doesn't do it. So, so the study area, fundamentally the study area was Central Street from Katahdin to Rhode Island, roughly. And that's really was our focus. And then we looked a little bit at Penobscot and I'll talk about it. Penobscot, we, we looked at um, in a very sort of broad qualitative way converting Penobscot from one way to two way. And I'll get there in a minute in terms of, you know, you know what, we, what we found from that perspective, but really it was about central, looking at ways to sort of enhance and improve conditions on Central Street. Um, before I talk about these, you know, during, during the process, there are a number of things that we did as part of understanding conditions within the corridor. Main DOT collected traffic volume data. So they were out here um, setting up counters. You may have seen them, tubes on the roadways. We also collected something called turning movement counts, understanding how many cars are turning, say on Central, turning left onto Penobscot. So we did counts at intersections along the corridor. And then we collected safety data. Main DOT has a, a tremendous database that tells us what kind of crashes are happening, where there are some problems to help us understand if there's some certain collision patterns that maybe we can mitigate as part of the process. So anyway, so when we started to get into it, we had really good baseline information. These were the things we started to think at. This was, this was before really digging into the data. These are some of the ideas that maybe would be a possibility for the quarter. 
bike lanes, pretty standard stuff, right? If you have the width stripe an area where people could bike to kind of separate themselves from cars. Improving sidewalks, it's kind of obvious. I think, I mean, I kind of walked around a little bit and, um, you know, sidewalks are not in great shape. So how do you improve sidewalks, making sure that, that, they're, that they're firm and stable and provide good uh, compliance. ADA, that's really um, um, about um, accessibility standards that are required to make sure that um, um, they can be used by everybody if you're in a wheelchair or whatever it may be. Crosswalks, shared youth pathways, I'll talk about a little bit in terms of what we're thinking about. That's a pathway. A little bit like the Nishu pathway, where it's a certain width and anybody can use that pathway, whether you're on a bike or you're walking or in a stroller, it doesn't matter. Um, thinking about sort of traffic control, whether you need signals or not, and then a host of other things. And I'll talk about many of these things that I get into sort of the draft ideas that we've come up with. So I'm gonna kind of walk through different segments and I'm gonna go through segment by segment first, and then I'll talk about some specific intersections and what we think about um, possibilities. Again, these are not, these, we call these draft ideas. We want feedback from you um, and to see you know, whether you think, you know, kind of good idea, not a good idea. We really wanna, we wanna hear from you. But basically this stretch from Katahdin to Penobscot, so this is sort of the Western section of the study area, it's a pretty good cross-section you know, in terms of, you know, when you think about sort of an urban design that has sort of good elements, you know, in terms of the bones of the, of the cross-section, it's pretty good. So we don't think there's a lot of change necessary in that, in that section. We think on-street parking should be prohibited, which would allow us to do some things to the, to the, to the street, which, which fundamentally providing bike lanes. If we can um, prohibit parking throughout that section. We can provide space for bike lanes and I'll show a graphic in a minute. Thinking about adding some, some, you know, some street trees to it, um, particularly on the south side um, um, as part of sort of improving sort of the aesthetics of the corridor. There's some, there's some not only benefit as it relates to just visually, but also you know, as it relates to traffic calming, sort of the, the view for somebody driving it changes as the, as the sort of cross-section changes with different design treatment. Thinking about adding some curb extensions, and that's like a little bump out at the corner um, that helps shorten the distance for pedestrians to cross, helps to calm traffic a little bit um, from a speeding perspective, also allows you to kind of design those corners to be ADA compliant for all, everybody that, um, that's, that's walking which leads to the ADA compliant issue. And then we did something called a planning level cost estimate. So what's it gonna cost? Something that, that everybody wants to know as part of these, this planning effort. And we've estimated you know, about $375,000 to upgrade that section of roadway to the, to the things we're talking about. Now, most of that is quite frankly, the sidewalk, upgrading sidewalks and making sure that the ADA compliant um, is, is, a good, is a good bulk of that. And so this is really the, the fundamental change um, that we're talking about, the left graphic represents, the left graphic, graphic represents existing conditions, roughly what existing conditions are like. Um, you know, you have 12 foot travel lanes, kind of, they're kind of, they like standard width, you know, sort of, you know, for, for a roadway. Um, but we're finding now that in, in constrained urban settings, you don't need that, uh, that much space. And so, one of the things we're suggesting is if you can if you can reduce those travel lane widths from 12 feet to 11 feet, you can pick up one foot and five feet is typically the minimum width for a bicycle lane. So by making some adjustment in the pavement markings, we can actually pick up space so that you can formally stripe and sign bike lanes in this in this section. That's really the big change. It doesn't show on the graphic. We talk about you know some trees. That would help sort of, you know, um, enhance the, the visual aspect of, of that section. And one note to make there is that we know that, uh, that the logging traffic has you know, decreased a lot over the years, but that there's still, you know, the need for that. So all these designs, you know, accommodate all, all the users in need. So it doesn't restrict any you know, future growth in, the, in those areas in terms of uh, meeting the truck needs. Yeah, and I'll talk about that also when I, when we, when I start presenting on some of, some of the intersections. So, 
Next section. So Penobscot to water. Again, I'll come back to the intersections, but Penobscot to water. Again, no general change in the cross section. Um, we think in, in general, the way it's set up is pretty good from an urban street perspective where it's located. Again, suggesting prohibiting parking in this section, which will allow us to provide again, formal bike lanes. Again, as you can see, we're setting up a comprehensive system starting at Katahdin, moving through town, headed, headed to the hill that will allow somebody to bike continuously through that corridor, which is quite frankly, wonderful. Um, so there's, it doesn't, I'll talk about a gap in that system in a minute, but it looks like we can get bike lanes all the way through there. Again, adding trees, looking at curb extensions, same sort of thing where you have a crosswalk, providing a little bit of, of a curb extension from the curb that'll shorten that distance, um, which, which really improves safety. Some access management, you know, the former auto dealer sites, right, trying to minimize the number of driveways that are onto Central Street to, to, to improve conditions. And then, and then improving sidewalk ramps for people at the corners and, and general crosswalks. And so similarly, this is, what, this is what it looks like in terms of the change. And so it's a little bit wider in this section than the section from um, Penobscot to Katahdin. And so we're able to keep the 12 foot lanes. This is the existing section where you have sidewalks currently on both sides. You have roughly an eight foot shoulder area um, and then the two travel lanes. And so we're gonna maintain those two 12 foot travel lanes and then restripe the shoulder area with something called a buffer. Sometimes it's, it's just a little paint. It's nothing, nothing raised or anything to help separate cars from people biking. Again, any kind of separation, ideally physical is the most safe, is the safest. Um, but in this case, we would have some sort of stripe buffer um, as part of as part of that condition, and then some sort of you know improved plantings, trees, um, you know within a, along along that edge. This this section is sort of like your downtown. So you know we thought there was good potential to sort of uh, with, with sort of create a more pedestrian scale with the street trees and the added streetscape. You know will help sort of the economy and just the general feel. So you, you sort of arrive to a place and. You come down the hill, you cross the stream. You know, there's more of a, the, the houses are closer together. You know, it, it feels more like a village, and so we're hoping that these proposed changes, you know, would add to that village character. Water to forest. So a few things, a few different things going on here. Um, and again, this in this stretch, sort of, you know, we've been we we think the section, you know, to the west is like I've said, and you know. Is pretty good, right? Two, one lane each direction, got some space that we can provide for bike lanes, sidewalks on both sides. This is where it opens up, right? I think everybody recognizes this is where it goes to four lanes. And so we've looked at the data. We don't, we suggest that you eliminate the right turn lanes. There are dedicated right turn lanes going westbound onto, onto Water Street and Forest Avenue. The data shows you don't need those. So we can literally take four lanes of traffic and put traffic in, in, in one lane in each direction. And, I, and I've, got, I've got a graphic. Then we can provide bike lanes in that section because the four lanes takes up the curb to curb width. And so by eliminating a lane in each direction, we pick up space to do something with. And so we think um, it'll provide a real balanced system by doing so. And then enhance, enhance the crosswalk at Forest Avenue. Now there's a flasher, it's kind of old technology. Um, um, we have, we have um, a more advanced technology in terms of providing flashing systems that are, are more visible to motorists um, that we think makes sense for that, for that location. And so this really sort of summarizes, you know, the general existing cross section and what we're thinking about in terms of proposed. So here's the existing one. There are four, four 12 foot lanes, two lanes going east and basically two lanes going, going west with right turn lanes onto forest and onto water. By eliminating one of those lanes, we pick up space for bike lanes, a really nice buffer. Again, that's paint, it's green, but it's not, it's not we, we can't landscape on top of the bridge. So, we, you know, so we're limited on what we can do. We're not gonna change the bridge, but ultimately we'll paint. And so have a really nice separation in that area with a single lane in each direction. And again, the data shows this, this will work. Um, 
one thing, one advantage of doing this is it's going to slow people down. I mean, I mean, it's pretty evident. We've heard it from, you know, you know, a lot of people that people go pretty fast, particularly coming down the hill. And when it's wide, it's a very, it only encourages people to go, to go very fast. Now we're continuing, we're going to go up the hill. So from forest to orchard, so mid, midway up the hill, roughly, or whatever it is. So we're suggesting changing that section. Right now, there's two, two lanes going up the hill, one lane coming down the hill. We think one lane up and one lane down is fine. We looked at some information and some and data about, about the need for a truck climbing lane. Um, and based upon our data and the number of trucks, we don't think that's necessary. Um, and again, if you know, the speeds are 25, again, to, to about orchard roughly, then it goes to 35. And so we think from a, from a regulatory posted speed limit perspective, one lane in each direction um, will work well. And so we'll provide six foot shoulders. We're, we're suggesting, and I'll get to the graphic because it's, it's probably not that clear you know, with the text, but we're suggesting, again, we're, we're able to eliminate one lane. And so we're gonna suggest sort of shifting the two lanes to the north and then basically create this median that separates the vehicular traffic from a path. So we're suggesting that we provide a shared use path on the south side so somebody could get from basically around that Forest Ave area and basically could, could get on this path in either direction to head up towards Irving or towards Hannaford or whatever it may be up in the commercial core to get from downtown to, to that area. So we provide a really nice, safe, separated facility. This will be a, you know, you know, you know, an excellent facility in terms of safety. Um, we need to widen the beauty of this in terms of, in terms of you know, you know, using that space. We're, we're able to save some cost. It's still going to be eight hundred thirty thousand dollars to do it, but we don't need to widen. We can kind of use that space um, to do it. Um, and, and let me let me show the graphic because I think it'll help explain that a little bit. And so, and so today, today. We have the two lanes going up the hill, one lane coming down the hill, and then we have a wide shoulder on the north side, 10-ish feet, and then one about eight feet on um, the south side. So a lot of width, it's wide. And I think, and, and that's one of the reasons why speeds are high, quite frankly. I mean, I mean, people drive at a speed in which they feel comfortable. And in this case, people feel very comfortable because it's a really wide stretch of roadway. And so ultimately, we're thinking about contextually changing things where you have one lane in each direction, six foot shoulders for space, and then that's that sort of landscape median that would separate the, the traffic, the, the, the vehicles from people on a 12 foot path. Again, that's all in the same space. It's all in the same space so it can fit nicely. And this path would run right up to the commercial uses um, you know, up, 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 and uh, up on on top of the hill. The next, the next section really is sort of finishing. Um, you know, the 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 study area, and that's basically orchard to to roughly Mass Ave. And so, um, it's a similar it's a similar type section. So, a couple of things, a couple of things um, that are going on. We're gonna we're gonna um, provide. Um, 11 foot center two way left turn lane. Some of you may have seen those before. It's where you have the, the arrows in opposite directions and people can turn left in that lane in the, on either side of the roadway. It's called the center two way left turn lane. We're suggesting providing that and eliminating one of the travel lanes. Right now there's four lanes in that section, two lanes in each direction. We're suggesting making it three lanes. So there'd be one lane in each direction and then there would be that center two way left turn lane. It's, it's, we call it a road diet. It's something that's been implemented, quite frankly, nationally uh, and, quite, and quite a bit in Maine, where quite frankly, you don't need the capacity um, from, a, from, from a lane um, perspective. Um, and so you're able to, to remove a lane, use that space for other needs, and it actually performs in a safer way by pulling some of those cars into that lane. It actually is safer than a four lane section. We're looking at providing some shoulders, same sort of saw cut, and I'll go through the graphic in a second. No widening. Um, and then I talked about the proposed three lane section. Now as part of that, just so you know, as part of that change, 
from four to three. We looked at the intersection at Rhode Island and Sycamore to make sure that the intersection would work um, um, from an operation perspective, that there wouldn't be undue congestion if you made a change. We did the modeling based upon the counts um, and the intersection will perform very well with, with that change. So, so basically, basically the top represents existing conditions, two lanes in each direction, east and westbound, um, a very sort of small shoulder. And then there's some sidewalks and particularly up in the, in the commercial area and in, in places. Um, and so the change really is at the bottom, if you can see it, we're going to have one lane in each direction and then that center to a left turn lane that will basically serve movements that want to go to either side um, um, of, of, of Central Street. And then we have that esplanade and a path. Now, the esplanade's a little bit narrower than what we had in the lower section. It's six feet versus eight feet. And the path is 10 feet versus 12 feet. There's a little bit less space up here. But again, it'll function um, it meets standards in terms of minimum requirements, um, and we think it'll function function pretty well. So one of the one of the I mean, it's, quite frankly, it's unique. I've been doing this kind of work for a long time, number number of years, and so um, um, when we do these these plans downstate, you don't you don't really get into this this issue. Quite frankly, recreation vehicles, snowmobile, ATVs. And making sure that the system, um, you know, integrates those types of, you know, you know, transportation modes into the system. And so, you know, we're really lucky. Um, we had some really good people on on our steering committee to help guide the process. And so, and so, basically, from a snowmobile snowmobile perspective, they will cross at Central Street at Forest, and then ultimately get themselves through the Medway Eastland intersection and get to a dedicated pathway that's gonna run basically up Wausau Street to the backside and get to the areas that they need to, need to go to. We know they wanna to get to the Irving station. And so you'll see it in a second, we're looking at reconfiguring the intersection um, at um, Eastland and Medway um, to help sort of, you know, incur, not encourage, but provide a sort of safer crossing for that. Um, and so our, our basic, um, you know, plan allows that to happen. Um, and then, and additionally for ATVs, we provided that shoulder going up the hill that allows them when needed to get into that shoulder space as part of, you know, doing what they need to do. So we did account for that as part of coming up with um, um, our, our suggested recommendations. So now I'm gonna spin back to intersections. So I'll start again to the west. They come east, and, and the first intersection is at Katahdin. And there are a few things that we recommended doing. One was eliminate the northbound right turn lane onto Katahdin Avenue. And again, that's coming up and turning right. Uh, we looked at the data. Um, there really isn't a need to have two lanes headed towards the intersection. Um, we still needed to make sure trucks can make that turn. You know, we, we, we designed it. You know, in terms of the concept so that large trucks can make the maneuvers that that um, that are needed and so ultimately we think there's some adjustment to that corner that can take place we're looking at eliminating that island that's in the middle and ultimately pulling that crosswalk that's that basically feeds to that island down a bit to a new crossing with ada ada compliance um, we suggest making some minor adjustments so this corner, you know, again, this is a relatively free flowing movement. It's yield controlled now. And so we think we can make some minor adjustments there. And then, and then upgrading crosswalks, ADA compliance ramps, so they meet standards. We do have a curb extension on the, that, that light blue is where we're bumping out the curb to make that crossing safer and shorter. That's that curb extension that I talked about. Um, and, and, and ultimately, this is about a seventy thousand um, dollar improvement uh, um, cost. Central Penobscot. So, um, few things. Similarly, there are a few lanes that that are needed. Again, we've got we collected the data and understanding how many cars make these turns. One is coming. In fact, you can see it on the aerial map. But the, the southbound Penobscot right is not needed, and the eastbound 
Penobscot right is not needed based upon the data. And so ultimately we suggest removing those. And again, helps free up some space. And so ultimately we can improve those corners. You know, all those corners need to be upgraded to ADA to meet standards, you know, ramps that allow uh, wheelchair accessibility. We can do some curb extensions. That's the light blue. So we can pull out the curb a little bit, not a lot, just because it is kind of tight. We got to make sure that larger vehicles can make can make the turns. The signal will be upgraded. It's 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 actually works pretty good. You know, when I've been here, I observed that it. it's actually pretty efficient. Um, but we would upgrade it. You need push new push buttons and pet heads. Things would need to be improved. Um, the one thing the one thing that that's interesting as as we did this study is that we have these markings that I show on this graphic. You can see that it, it's something called a shared lane marking. And so ultimately we can provide a bike lane towards forest coming in this direction. And we have a bike lane going to Katahdin from this location, but we don't have room for a bike lane through the intersection. And that's because of the left turn lane going on the Penobscot. That's taking up the space that prevents us from getting a continuous bike lane basically from the entire stretch of, of the project limits. So, so one of the things we, we modeled, we did, a, we did a traffic model, we looked at, well, what if we got rid of that left turn lane? And the model said, it'll still work okay. Now, we recognize that there's still a lot of people turning into town. And, and so what we suggest is that, we do, that there'd be a, a demonstration project testing it. And we would test eliminating the right turn lane, see how things work before, before making a decision. And if it's determined through that effort that doesn't work well, then this is, there are two options. You either go back to the shared lane, which is not great, right? You'd be in a bike lane and you got to get out of your bike lane and you get back in a bike lane or perform some widening that would allow you to provide the bike lane and maintain that left turn lane. So we think that study makes sense given the modeling shows that it looks like it can work without that left turn lane. Talked about Medway and Eastland. We think, we think there's benefit to combine those two, those two um, intersections. Right now you're, it's kind of, I mean, even though the volume isn't that high, it's kind of a funky little spot there where you have people coming out of both roadways at the same spot. So we think we think we can create a safer condition, not only from a vehicle operation perspective, but again, this is where we're going to have that path that's going to run up the hill. And we think it'll be a safer crossing for anybody that's using that path, whether on a bike or on foot, to get through that intersection. So, so we think. That's part, and then also, this is also where we think the snowmobiles will ultimately, you know, head through there or, or do now. And, and, and lastly, there's a little bit of a, I'll say a pocket park on that corner. It does provide more opportunity maybe to do a little bit more on that corner in terms of that, that green space pocket park area. This is about $115,000 in terms of, in terms of this cost for this one. Central Street, uh, Rhode Island at Sycamore. Um, this is, so this kind of shows conceptually the thought where we would have basically one lane in each direction, and then we'd have turn lanes like you have now. But again, remember it was, it's four, but we would go to three and develop that two-way left turn lane. And again, this is the path that's on the south side. Um, and so we're looking at upgrading the crosswalks, making everything ADA compliant. <laughs> got to change the signal. We change the lanes. We got to upgrade the signal. So this costs, quite frankly, for that. Um, and then the path, we're suggesting that it continues to the east towards Massachusetts, given some of those destinations on that side. And this is just under four hundred thousand um, as part of doing part of doing that one. So those are kind of the. I'll say a snapshot of the thoughts that we have as it relates to Central Street and some of the improvements. Um, talk a little bit about two-way. Again, this was, this was a broad 30,000 foot view. We didn't do parking surveys. Uh, we didn't do a lot of, we did some modeling, but you know, we didn't dig into specific things 
um, um, you know, in terms of understanding deliveries specifically, some of that stuff would be, I'd say, a, you know, a potential outcome after this, depending upon what we hear and what people think. But ultimately, um, one of the things that we're tasked with doing is, what about changing Penobscot from one way to two way? And, and quite frankly, communities are thinking about that. I, I had a meeting, Marty was at the meeting last Thursday in, in, in Brunswick, we were looking at a stretch of Pleasant Street in Brunswick, changing that from one way to two way. And so communities are looking at it, Warrenville just did the same thing, Augusta just did the same thing. So people, communities are rethinking their downtown streets and whether one way makes sense anymore. So, so ultimately one of the sort of, I'll say, cons of going from one way to two way um, is loss of parking. Because that's generally, and when you think of the current street, right, you have parallel parking on one side and you have angled diagonal parking on the other side. To go to two-way, you can keep the parallel on one side, but you'd have to convert the angled diagonal parking to parallel. And by doing so, you lose supply. And so ultimately, we, we look at it. Um, and so we're looking, you know, basically a loss of about 16 parking spaces if you made that change. Now we didn't do, like I said, a parking demand study to say how, how much parking demand is currently being generated you know, in the area and, and parking usage. Um, my general observations when I've been here is, is that there is available supply, but again, that's typically one of the key elements that comes up with a conversion um, you know, um, you know, within a community. Some of the general pros, cons, two-way streets tend to have slower speeds. Um, they tend to be less confusing about how to get in and out of a town. You know, what street do I, how do I get to where I need to go because of one way? Um, and so, you know, in this case, you know, I think you'd see some reduction in volumes on some of the abutting parallel streets by going two-way, right? Because people have to circulate through as part of, um, you know, the restrictions. One-way streets can be a little bit easier for pedestrians. They don't, they don't have to worry about traffic and coming from one direction. So there's been some studies that suggest that it can be a little bit, a little bit safer, um, given that it's less complex. Um, Two-way streets tend to improve the livability of the neighborhood in terms of, you know, this is these are some studies that were done nationally, um, just as part of increased property values and business revenue just as part of foot traffic and bike traffic and just what goes on with that, with that, with that change. And so um, that was my last slide. And so um, now we wanna hear from you guys. Um, there's a lot here. I can go back to slides. If you have a question like Tom, I, I, I need, I have a clarifying question, all cool. And if, you know, I'm happy, I'm happy to go back to slides, but um, I'm going to open it up for um, comments, questions, feedback. Yes. Um, first of all, thank you uh, for all that. I'm curious about uh, with a lot of those changes, especially on Central Street, uh, what do you envision for ongoing maintenance costs? Because when you look at the paint, especially and how often we'd have to repaint and other things like that, do you have an idea of, of what we'd be looking at? Yeah, we don't we don't typically estimate, you know, you know, what's the increase in maintenance cost for a community, there'll be more cost right and, and there's sort of two things that come into play with that one. And it's quite relevant in this community one is the sort of annual painting or or making sure signage is in place signage is in place, but the one item that comes up, it would be winter maintenance right I mean are you know would you plot like that path. That pathway running, if, if in fact it's something that, that the community wants to do and implement, would you need to plow it in the winter? I, well, yeah, probably is what you would just see. You would see some sort of additional burden to the public works department as part of, you know, you know, plowing, um, you know, those systems. Um, we don't typically come up with a price tag on that, like what, you know, how, you know, how much more would that be? But it's it's a legitimate increase in some in, in a budget for a community thank you and i wasn't implying opposition by asking that question i had yep. no issue with your overall plan but if you had a number that's what i was wondering yeah sure thank you yep yes sir i just a suggestion i think it would be advantageous to go through the slides so that we're not jumping around on subject matters 
of what people have questioned that by sections. Sound good for people? Yes. All right, let's go. I'm going to go and I'll stick to I'll stick to the graphics. Does that make sense? We'll stick to the, so we don't go to every every slide. So let's start. This is this is the first section. Uh, Katan to Penobscot. Questions? Yes, sir. Um, the blinking light at Katan and Central is a disaster. Very unsafe. Traffic coming from the south heading north on Katan has to stop. Traffic coming from the north heading south on Katan has the right of way to go straight or to turn left sure. on the yeah. Central. Yeah. And it could be a real game of chicken. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know whether that has been considered. We made no mention of it in this presentation, but I don't see how improvements to that <clears throat> intersection could be made without considering the uh, lights. It's a, it's, a, it's a good question. And, and part of that's because of the predominant movement is, is the movement you're talking about, yes. which led to, to that sort of traffic control. Um, I, I mean, I'm not quite sure. I do think some change may make sense. So it's something it's something that I can I can think about and, and look into for that. Thank you. Yep. Anything else on this slide? Oh, me. oh sir. Yeah, you, uh, I, I assume you're referring to the blinking light at the, at the bottom of Central Street Hill, uh, the pedestrian crosswalk. That Cotton Avenue one that's on there, that is a, yeah, that's a crap shoot. So, yeah. so, <laughs> so I, 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 guess, I just I need to think about that and, and, and uh, see if I can come up with a, a, a you know, recommendation. Yep. So I'm free to move on. I'm just going to check on here. I can't necessarily see participants. Um, well, just check it for any hand raises. On the screen, I see none. All right. Anything else on this section before we move on? Yes, sir. You talked in reference to having no parking. There isn't any parking along that section. That's only, only, only near near Penobscot. Well, yes, Every down that section. Yeah, for the rest of the that we're correct. You're talking about eliminating the the, uh, the late the turn lane. I think there's only two parking spots above that. Okay. Correct. There are a few right there, are a few right near the intersection. Correct. Yep. Um, we did have a suggestion in the chat from somebody uh, attending via Zoom. Um, if people could identify themselves when uh, when they make a comment or ask a question, it would be very helpful for those online. Uh, if we could do that moving forward, please. All right, let me let me go to the yeah, we're gonna go, we'll go section by section, then we'll go back to intersection. So some of the stuff may may pop up, but Penobscot to water. Questions. You talked about at the intersection sure. having an extension going out into the road. Correct. How would that be plowed? Would that impact the plowing snow removal? Yeah, I mean, I mean, when we find in communities that that um, implement things like curb extensions, I'm sorry, or... Charles Prey. <laughs> yeah, what we find with changes to sort of intersection design, whether it be like a roundabout or these curb extensions, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, quite frankly, TPWs and plow crews, they they learn how to adjust and eventually there may be a period of time where they've got to figure that out but well, after um, a couple of years you are replacing them no and so you know we there could be an initial period of time where we put delineators up so it's it's obvious where they are like it's covered in snow right you don't want to hit them right so so there are ways we you know we have to employ things to help help you know plow drivers you know, somebody somebody has uh, learned how to draw on the screen here i'm not asking to refrain from doing that okay i think it's the european house okay um um let's see if i get to another slide is it still there uh, yeah. it should change 
Um, all right, well, we gotta keep, we gotta move on. We gotta move on. I can, I can see through the red. <laughs> so any, any more comments on the Catan to Penobscot? Yes, sir. Um, Ralph Susie, Public Works Director. Um, what, what we notice a lot is uh, that section right there, there's a lot of people, when they pull up to turn left, going to State Street towards the high school, yeah. coming this way, yeah. you'll see a lot of, not all people, but uh, there's a lot of people that pull out and pass on the right. Yeah. So when we put the delineators in for our bicycle did, project, did, 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 kind of stopped that. So got it, got it. Yeah, that can be that can become a safety issue. Right? Yeah. You're pulling, you're pulling around somebody, someone's trying to potentially cross yeah, we, the crosswalk or something. So yeah, we see a lot of that. Yeah, that, that section of town right there. So. Right, and so some of those curb extensions could help with that. Right, yeah. like pulling, like pulling the curb out a little bit. All of a sudden, it's not inviting somebody to kind of bypass that left turn right. vehicle. So that could be that's one of the benefits of of doing doing so. Anything else on this one? All right, let's. So that's Penobscot to water, which which we, we talked about. I think I backed up by accident. Um, what about water to forest? The four lanes on the, I, I'll go on the bridge that goes to two. What about that section? There isn't a, Charles Bragan, there is not a turn lane coming down the hill from the forest. It's a single lane. People pull out and use it as a turn lane. There is a turn oh, lane. Yeah, turn lane. Yeah. Yeah. Mark. Gosh, I never noticed that. So <laughs> I haven't been that part of town a lot. You're going too fast. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the things you're suggesting to remove, for those of us that have, have lived here our, our whole lives, Central Street going up and down that street used to be a two lane. As population increased and traffic increased, along working with the Department of Transportation, those lanes were put in for a safety reason. Both turning onto Forest Avenue, coming down Central Street Hill, and turning onto Medway Road and Eastland Avenue going up. It eliminated congestion. It eliminated the, it was more of a safety issue to be able to handle the, the uptake and volume of the traffic. Bellinocket is in a situation where we went from having a smaller population to a larger population and a larger amount of, of uh, traffic that is why the, the lanes were put there. Now we've dropped down in population, but we're striving to try to go ahead and grow our population again. What I'm wondering is, is Central Street gonna become the yo-yo of, with these plans, we go from two lanes to four lanes, back to two lanes, will we eventually now talk about this in 20, 25 years, when we're gonna to have to go back to four lanes again? It seems to me that we're, we're recreating the same situations we tried to alleviate previously by going ahead and reducing the lanes down for the turning. They were put there. I mean, this is this was not the town of Milwaukee decided this at the time. This is a state road, and it was part of in a collaboration with the Department of Transportation to alleviate a lot of congestion and create a safety buffer, basically, for traffic moving up and down Central Street. So I don't want to necessarily see. Not, I mean, in all fairness to your plan, I, I your your arguments are are valid to a certain extent, but I just don't see. I, I don't want to have to revisit this in 25 years because we did this, we spent all this money, and now we need those four lanes back because the population has increased, I hope. Because after all, we're looking to go ahead and do economic development here with no site and that, bring new families in. That's going to increase traffic, not just bike traffic. And we need those lanes to be able to be safe, I believe. Good, good, good question. And so, when we looked at we modeled the traffic, when we modeled the traffic, we did assume some growth. We assumed 10% growth. And 10%, you know, what we're finding in the state, 10% growth. We're finding communities are growing half a percent per year. They're not growing 
a, maybe a percent some, but but we're finding that it's half percent. So we're looking at a scenario of, of traffic growth that could be 10, 15, 20 years in the future in terms of you know how we applied and modeled conditions. So you know, so we we feel like we've accounted for some growth. Now, yeah, it, it's possible growth is more than that, but I can just say the three lane section can handle a lot more growth than that 10%. And, and the turn mo turning movements onto whether it be forced or water, again, the numbers show that those numbers can be, can be handled. And again, in a, in a two lane roadway safely, given, you know, given the numbers that we're talking about. And so I can't, I, I, don't, I don't know historically, you know, what drove the decisions specifically you know, about two lanes going up the hill. I can speculate, my guess is it was related probably somewhat to truck traffic and going up the hill and, and slow movements and people wanting to, you know, gain some mobility. That's probably probably what happened. And my guess is the right turn lanes on the forest and water just sort of organically, of you know, you know happened. But the day it... The, well, it didn't just organically happen. This, like I say, this was a well thought out, well conceived engineering problem. Uh, solution to handle a problem that was creating more accidents more accidents happening than there was before well i, I mean I'll, I'll try to find some of that some of that background on those things um but you know but the data that we have now shows that again what we have can 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 function safely for a number of years with again again we've assumed 10 10 percent growth so um, um but, but i'll see if i can find some of the historic information um, about about what drove some of those things, just to kind of you know you know respond to that comment. And before you leave from this, if I could, I'm concerned about your designation of where the snowmobiles could cross Central Street. Traffic coming down Central Street Hill, there is. If you're if you're crossing uh, to get to trail, uh, I'm concerned about the. Uh, ability of traffic coming down to be able to see snowmobiles in time so there's a, there's a short there's a short like that doesn't actually change the crossing is the exact same location but where is it coming up through the park yeah. yep just how it's laid out right now and and that actually was a that was a separation from this project that was uh something we had talked about internally with um was in our economic development committee meeting um, in consultation with John Raymond and others uh, about that potential reroute. Uh, but it's 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 after the snowmobile trail comes across uh, right about Forest Avenue, uh, cuts up through that small pocket park there, and then the reroute actually starts once it gets on the other side of Medway Road, and then moves up towards Wausau, rather than coming up the shoulder of Central Street. Uh, I do want. I, I'm fine. Okay, I did want to just address some of these messages we've been getting in the chat. Um, I'll go ahead and read these out loud here from Jim's phone. <laughs> um, we've got a bike lane. As far as I'm concerned, the plastic posts that were installed were in the way of turning semi trucks, straight trucks, and buses. Uh, it was very congested because of these posts. A clear example of a solution to a non-existent problem. I will add that um, the post that were installed last summer was a completely different project, uh, separate from uh, what we're speaking about today. Uh, though some of that information can be useful uh, in developing these decisions, I uh, just want to highlight that that was a separate um, project. Um, Randy said, Randy Jackson says three lanes um, with the central lane for turning as in Lincoln. Lincoln has more, much more traffic than Millinocket and they handle it well with three lanes. Um, and then another message from Jim's phone here says, I'm only talking about the intersections. So thank you for that input, James and Randy. Check back with that in a moment. 
uh, those online, just so that you're aware, you are able to um, unmute and provide a comment uh, by speaking if you uh, so wish. And, and just to add to Tom's, sorry, Tom's comment about the temperature growth. Uh, you know, part of what we're looking at in terms of capacity and livability is how to try to encourage economic development and growth by doing a project like this. So um, it may seem counterintuitive that you're, you're promoting pedestrian quality and bike quality, and that may be taking away from, via, potentially taking away from vehicles, but part of the work is trying to sort of see a new future where it's more livable and it might actually attract people to the community who want, who want, who want like a, a more walkable type of community, a place where they can, their kids are more safe or people can bike to the store. So it actually is accommodating and trying to promote growth, but in a way that we're, you know, that's not only tied to sort of say tractor trailer traffic or uh, vehicle traffic, it's trying to look at all, all the users. Um, and I said that it can be a little counterintuitive, but it's something we try to promote and embrace as part of growth. I'll come to you next. Uh, Jim Dozier. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about priorities. We've got three issues here. We have vehicles, we have pedestrians, we have bicycles. And it seems to me the greatest emphasis is on the bicycles. The greatest problem is for the pedestrians walking, and the vehicles are just fine. I wonder what your priorities are. Yeah, I, I don't I don't have any priorities. I would just say that when we developed the plan, we looked at all three of those modes and ultimately developed the plan. We didn't we didn't dis, discount pedestrians. That shared use path is meant to serve both people on bikes, people walking strollers, people in wheelchairs. And so it's got it's a shared use facility for everybody. We think the sidewalks need to be up, upgraded. Quite frankly. Again, the main core of Central Street is, is it's got the, the bones. I mean, the sidewalks just need to be upgraded. They need to be made ADA compliant. So I think when you see this, I think you're probably it probably appears like we're 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 discounting or disregarding pedestrian. But in general, you have really good facilities. And then at each one of those crosswalks that exist along Central, we think there's considerations for curb extensions. Some some will require flashing beacons like what you have at Forest. So those are those are you know discounted. I mean you can go to the report. The main I don't know if you read the report, but there is a draft report that gets into some of this material in, in greater detail. We kind of just give sort of an overview here, but we're not discounted. We pedestrians are important. Kids walking to school super important. Um, um, but I think when you look at it, I think some of the changes to the roadway really, really present the bike bike element. Of it. Yes, ma'am. I might have missed it. Oh, Cindy Ingers. I might have missed it, but if you eliminate the left turn onto an odd spot for the downtown, how would you enter downtown? You can still make the turn from a single share. From a single share. Single share. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We'll address a couple of messages here in the chat. Um, can, can whoever uh, drew on the screen <clears throat> delete it? That's from Stephanie Jameson. Um, she also mentions the directions on how to do that. <laughs> View options, annotate, clear with a smiley face. Very nice of her to offer that advice. Thank you. Uh, Susan D'Alessandro says, um, do we still need the screen share? Uh, I think that what we're doing is going through the, the, the slides here um, to prompt the questions. Um, so I think it's to keep the information fresh so that um, uh, the questions and comments from the audience both in person and online can be um, on the current information that's on the screen. Um, is there an estimated price breakdown for the different pieces? Uh, for instance, Penobscot changes, Katahdin changes, snowmobile rerouting. Um, again, the snowmobile reroute is a slightly different project. We just included the information here, uh, but that work is being done in our economic development committee. Uh, so, um, Susan, I know that you often participate in those uh, committee meetings, so we can talk more about that there. Um, 
the price estimates or the cost estimates on each section have been included in each slide. Uh, so we can, uh, each descriptive slide, I guess, rather than the visual. Um, so we can kind of go over those as we go through again, if you, uh, if you wish. And then Randy also shares, this does, this does have a more town community feeling uh, and not a zip way for pulp trucks. Uh, uh, for, for pulp trucks, we have to live together. Thank you. Yeah, I went through some of the costs, but I, I think I missed some. So that information is in the slideshow um, and in the draft report as well. That's, that's I believe, posted. Is it, is it posted, the draft report? Um, yes, it's posted yeah. to our website. Yeah. So, so there, are, there are costs provided. Um, anything more before I move up the hill? Uh, uh, the next Tom? One. Yes. This is Louis Pelletier from uh, Concord Street. Hi, Louis. Uh, as, a, I, as a resident that's uh, traveled Congress Street in my wheelchair quite a bit, I uh, really appreciate the uh, improvements that's trying to be made to accommodate biking and, and pedestrians. Uh, a lot of the intersections are like uh, Medway Road is specifically is quite a long stretch to cross, narrowing that down to a, a standard roadway crossing, you know, very helpful. And and this, the idea of the two lanes traveling the, the travel lanes, the length of Central will really accomplish the traffic calming we're looking for I mean, if you're ever walking that stretch up to the uh, commercial district up there, you're finding, you know, vehicles 35, 45 zipping by you. For people that uh, don't travel so fast or can't walk so fast, that uh, burst of wind can really uh, put a scare into them. Um, so it's really a great improvement. And one of the things I really like about the project is that we're not changing any of the curbs. So therefore, to address Council Maduro's concerns in 25 years, which I don't think he'll be around to worry about, uh, that, you know, the lanes, can, it can go back to three lanes, you know, no big deal. Thank you. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, so we're gonna, first orchard. Comments? Yes, ma'am. Um, I just want to say thank you for all the work and the research you put into this. I'm extremely supportive of the walkway up the side of Central Street. Um, I love walking around here. I think it's actually really unique for a town this small that it's so dense and walkable. And, but this is a critical missing link that we need to make it more accessible for people of all ages. So I'm very supportive of this part of the project. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anybody else? Yes, sir. No, my name is Wally Paul. Uh, I, I have concerns about I, I live on Eastland Avenue, which is in the Medway Road, Eastland Avenue uh, intersection. Uh, that's, the, that's the road that people from the new development turn into to go to the dump. And it's also the section that people from Little Italy drive through to get out to, to Central Street. So it's a it's very active and it's active year round. Even when there's no bicycles, there's still a lot of traffic there. And there are times that having two lanes is what allows you to get out onto the road or to get to get around and get into it. It's like one of the pinch points that we have right there at that intersection. And this is the first time seeing it, so I'm not prepared to say, let's never do this or let's do it right now. But uh, I'm going to be looking at it and, and trying to understand it. But uh, as soon as you as soon as you said it, I started feeling some real concerns. In addition to that, I'm one of the uh, the regular pedestrians in town that that we're trying to, to accommodate. I walk all the time. I walk down here to this meeting. Um, Central Street is a, it is the artery in town. 
but it's not the it's not the pedestrian path for most of us and most of my people, most of my friends who, who walk who I know who I bump into. I mean, there are there are neighborhoods that are are calm and quiet, and that's where that's where most of the pedestrian work is. That's where most of the bicycle riding is, and that type of thing. I think myself. If I had to say something right off the top again, I, I'm going to look at this and, and, and understand it before I before I make it a, an opinion on it. But the sidewalks are in rough shape. If we're looking at, at older people and there are cracks in the sidewalks, it's raised level. I mean, I trip from time to time, and, and I'm I'm a fairly healthy walker. I, I, I feel as if there are a lot of them that we have let go too long. I take responsibility for some of that. I haven't been on the council at one time, and well, that's what you, that's what you do when you start getting in the budget crunch. I realize that it's a it's a it's a no fault but real but real problem. Um, when you, when you, when you Central, Central Street is Central Street, though, to me is where I drive. The neighborhood is where I walk, right. and I do that recreation. Yeah. So when you do get to a point where you think you've got a conclusion, I mean, provide the comments to Peter. I can just say this is a typical um, situation that we get into when we're looking at trying to balance all the needs within a corridor. Now, I mean, I, I mean, just my observations, there are still people that want to walk from the downtown to go up to the commercial board. I saw them today. So there's a need. Yeah. I, I respect your comment about, about getting out of East Lane and, and, and using one of the lanes as part of getting into traffic, but there's a sense that people are speeding in that section too. And so there is some sense that trying to repurpose that street so that everybody can use it. Not every, that's not gonna be all pros, right? If there'll be some, some you know people, trucks, vehicles that will potentially see a slower, less mobile sort of you know, path along Central, but again, in, in, in totality with everybody, um, you know, I think the vision really is think, trying to think about everybody and how best to do it. And so um, it's, a, it's a balancing act. It really is. Oh, it's, a, it's a balancing act. You know? yeah. I, this, this gentleman first, because he had his hand up. Hi, my, name, my name is Michael Sprock. And uh, thank you for your presentation and your study. I'm curious were there vehicle countings involved? Like, did you? Did you stay in place and determine and count the cars and trucks in a certain time period at what different periods of the day? Not, not me, physically, <laughs> but May DOT, they have a, a group, traffic counter group that, that collects data all and, over the state. And so they were here collecting data um, on stretches of central and at intersections um, you know, within the study area. So we collected good current data. For, for now, I've, I've seen the equipment they usually use. It's that rubber hose that one used to ding at a gas station. That's one of them, right? <laughs> That's, <laughs> one of them. <laughs> That's when there were pay phones, if any yeah. numbers. Uh, I'm curious, that data probably does not incorporate number of cyclists that are in town. We do get that. So they, they collect data in two different ways. One is the ding or two that you talked about. The other is they actually do video. So nowadays we set up with cameras and we basically sheet down an intersection and the video basically gets through a database process, collects data in terms of understanding the number of passenger cars, the number of trucks, type of trucks, bicyclists and pedestrians. So we're able to collect all that information through that video count system that's, that's important. Well, forgive me, I, didn't, I came in a little late. <laughs> Was that presented at the beginning? We did not present it. It's in the report, but in this presentation, we didn't want it to chew up a lot of time. We couldn't go through everything. It would be entirely too long. So we sort of drilled out to approve it. But in terms of those draft recommendations, so no, like we didn't go through numbers. Well, I think those numbers would be helpful, especially uh, when you put the dollar numbers on there, too. I think that people need to see that the relevance um, and also the relevance of state funding, grant funding, resident funding. And I think that'd be helpful in decision-making if we ever get to that point. Yeah, that, 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 I think that's a good point, right? This is this is the first step in the process, right? This is the <coughs> step. So this is sort of just 
developing these these concepts and ideas about about you know what makes sense there's a partnership with main DOT in terms of moving this forward and then it's up to the community quite frankly to make decisions about how, how to best you know move forward um and, and moving things to the next step what you know which would be design and then ultimately implementation we provide some costs so you have some sense about what we're talking about um but it's it'll be the community that makes the decision about how, how to move forward Thank you, I'm Jane Danforth, and I want to respond to Wally to a couple of your comments. Um, as the, one of the instigators of this study, my concern about uh, the safety of walkers on Central Street. So I'm with you. If I'm going out for my health for to get a walk in, I'm not walking Central Street. I'm scared to death walking on Central Street. But where my house is, my backyard, I see the traffic on Central Street all the time. You would be amazed at the traffic. Um, of walkers and people going up and down that don't have um, another way of, of, of getting around. They don't have a car. So I see families, I see older yeah. folks walking up and down Central Street to get to whether they're going to shop at Irving or they're going Family Dollar sure. or the Dollar Tree or yeah. Hanover. Not, I, not the Dollar Tree. Dollar Tree. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Excuse me. Uh, you're right. Um, so that is my concern of people needing to use that corridor. We get foot traffic it. and also I've seen a lot of these motorized scooters. There's people in wheelchairs, so it's just a changing community and the concern about that we want a walkable community and that to be safe for folks that have to use that corridor in that way. And then also looking to the future, do we want to be a bike friendly community? You know, if so, we have to create the structure for it here. And on that topic, I'd like to put the one youth member of our community that at the meeting, Sean. Would you mind speaking up and telling the group about your um, the study that your uh, your peers did? About, is it the high school or middle school? Uh, middle school, our eighth grade class. We Thank you, Sean Strong. Our eighth grade class. What we do is um, our teachers or others will um, use it as Project Citizen, where um, uh, me and my peers get to vote on what public um, policy we want to see maybe implemented in the town. So we uh, we came up with um, better bike infrastructure. <laughs> um, so um, then we took a survey with you know, we came out with eighty two applicants, and we found some data. But we really found that the town is in a dire need of bike infrastructure. And I thank you for this presentation because it also brings in pedestrian and safer. Um, driving centers. So it really kind of works together really well with our project. So thank you for that. Thank you. Comment in the chat, I'll read. This is from uh, Sarah, Sarah Jondro, the age friendly Milwaukee. Uh, many folks are not only recreational walkers, uh, but to do their shopping, Increase in the uh, increase in those who ride motorized wheelchairs up and down Central, um, and with the gas prices high, perhaps uh, the use in this way will only increase. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Remind people too that we're only talking about basically late spring summer, early fall, and then wheelchair accessibility to Central Street, whether you put a path there or not, unless you've got snow tires on that thing, that's not an option either way. Or, you know, walking safely along there is another thing. This is, this is a very seasonal proposal. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying, let's put it in perspective that this is a seasonal proposal and not a year round one for the majority of what, uh, whether you're talking about bicycles or wheelchairs, or uh, for that matter, geez, I really don't want to see, I hope I don't see a lot of elderly people trying to walk up Central Street Hill in the middle of February. And you do. But, uh, Absolutely. Sort of Absolutely. I, 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 and families with young children. I have seen some that have gone around trying not to trying to avoid that hill for the simple reason it is winter 
mm -hmm. uh, and gone Forest Avenue and went around to try to come up in a better location instead of trying to climb the hill. But yeah, it, it's a very seasonal uh, perspective. And where I could say, I just, that's just not I just accurate. Want to be very careful. Like, that's just not accurate. There's there's people all through the season who are trying to get up that hill. Up no, but what they're bringing up, especially as far as bicycles, wheelchairs, things like that, those are not, you know, those are not those are very debate. I just I want to offer the opposition. It, so, it, it's all, please. Yeah, so, so I'm a biker. I don't like that much of the weather. Full disclosure, I don't. But ironically, the community that has some of the highest bike mode share throughout the year, Minneapolis. And it's partly because that's that they've created this culture and system and and people people embrace it. And so um, you know, but uh, like me, I, I don't. I'm not on my bike, you know, a lot in the wintertime. So I, you know, we, we are in a tough where is a tough climate? There's no question about it. Also, Stephanie Jameson adds, uh, folks who use wheelchairs still go places in the winter. That's very true. And, you know, I, I, I would just add that, you know, it, it's very real that uh, members of our community need to walk from downtown or across town through that corridor uh, to get their groceries, to get you know their their um, hygiene products, uh, to get many things. Farmers. And Farm, pharmacy. Yep, farm, <laughs> pharmaceutical. I, I think uh, it had to use please. <laughs> um, and, and and it's it is dangerous when there is uh, you know young parents with young kids and it's the middle of winter and you know Ralph and his crew are up trying to plow the roads and yeah they're not riding their bikes and they're probably not in a um, motorized wheelchair trying to make that hill in the middle of winter but there are people every day in our community that need to walk rather they either they're by themselves or they're you know with their family or their significant other and they've got bags and they've got you know, a wagon in some cases, um, it's very real. And if we can create a safer environment for them to do that, then by all means, why not support it? Um, you know, we, of course, there's going to be conversations uh, in the future about how do we fund some of these suggestions if we land on, you know, the idea that we're going to implement them, you know, not, not finalized by any means right now, uh, but there are funding opportunities. There are grant programs through the main um, Department of Transportation. There are um, there are resources out there that we can tap into to help uh, alleviate the financial burden on the community. But it really is about safety across the line, not necessarily seasonal recreation. No. Then I have to ask one more thing. Is it about transportation or is it about pedestrian just traffic? Because if it's about transportation, shouldn't we be talking about some form of public transportation to be available for people who the very people that you're talking about to be able to get from point A to point B who otherwise wouldn't have any form of transportation to be able to do rather than see them out in 30 degree below weather? It's also a very good point, but this is bike and pedestrian. It's not a point of this specific <laughs> endeavor. That's also very good. That's something we need in a very big way. Brittany Bruner, I would also argue that Millinocket is spending a lot of time and effort on making this community a four season destination. So focusing on one aspect of seasonality, one study is too much. We focus a lot on, you know, bringing people in here for the winter. So why not focus on trying to bring people in in a safe way for every other season that we have? You have some comments as well in the chat. When you're... John Raymond adds, 
uh, would this walkway bike path not allow e-bikes? I think that would be up to the. They would be allowed. They would be allowed. Would be General allowed. consensus is it's allowed under standard practice, both within the state and, and across the nation. But there are opportunities for for private facilities to develop their own policies if they're having problems to address. Thank you. Uh, and then Stephanie Jameson adds, would the town need to purchase any new equipment in order to clear these paths during the winter months? Um, or would it be similar to what is done now uh, for sidewalks? I don't know that answer. Uh, I don't Public think. Works Director Ralph says probably not. Yep. Probably not. Um, we're not physically doing anything to the yep. road, so we're, yep. we're going to maintain it like we always do. Mm -hmm. All right. And the additional suggestion if there were a separate bike path, uh, walking lane created, that could be done with the, like the sidewalk machine. Yeah, yeah. makes sense. Makes or sense. at 10 foot width, a pickup truck. Pickup truck. Well, pickup truck would probably do it. Hi, I'm Sandy Sullivan. And to address Mr. Madure, when I leave my house every day, I come out Mass Avenue and down Central. And every single day, winter, summer, fall, spring, you see people carrying grocery bags up and down that hill. People walk, and I think to myself, they are brave. I wouldn't walk out there, but they have no other. They have no other place to do it. We need to make them safe. Yes, maybe a minibus would help, but that's not what we're talking about right now. We're talking about people walking up and down. And my other comment is, Medway Road and East Market. I was wiped out as a teenager coming out of Medway Road with a truck coming down Central Street and pushed almost into the stream. People can't see coming down that hill. They can't really see people coming out from Medway Road. Yeah. And so I think it's a great idea to make it one road instead of two, because now you're only guessing uh, you're not having three different areas of people coming out. All right, All right so. Oh, one more. All right. This is from John Raymond at Central Street and Penobscot Ave. Would the parking spaces still be there on both sides uh, of the road up to Highland Avenue? The, the plan is that they would not be there on Central. To, to allow for the bike lanes, those spaces yeah. would need to be prohibited. All right, so um, just trying to think what else, what else, what else um, we've gone through a lot. Um, why don't I go to intersections? Uh, I, I, actually, I want to go to, I want to go to uh, two-way. What do people think about two-way? I'll can come. I'll go back to the intersection. What do you think about two-way? Because I haven't heard anybody say yay, nay. Any any sense on two-way? Yeah, yes, ma'am. It's not about two-way, but what is the plan for this process from this point forward? So actually, I have a slide. <laughs> but let me go to my slide. I don't even remember what I said. No, I'm kidding. So so. Um, we'd like comments basically by the end of the month, you know, you know, just based upon our schedule. Again, this is a partnership with um, Main DOT. We, based upon the comments, we'll then consider those comments as part of finalizing the study. Um, and then ultimately, it's again, like I said, the town will consider this study and the recommendations as part of as part of you know moving to the next steps. So, I mean, in terms of uh, the two way suggestion. And possibility for uh, Penobscot Avenue. Can you go over again um, how much parking would be eliminated? Sixteen spaces. Sixteen total spaces is what we estimate. Yeah, sixteen spaces is what we estimate. And 
about the two-way street. Oh, sorry. No. Um, the two-way street. I'd be concerned about it all be being parallel parking. I don't know how custom everyone in the town is to parallel parking. And so do you, I'm just, what was it? Uh, how do you, how, how do you consider the difference? I didn't, I don't see any problem, whether it was then or now. Uh, either you way. You don't have the, you don't have the, Stores in the main street used to have back in the 50s. Right? Yeah. So it's really, you know, it's just what we've called up by Central Streets where the most activity goes. We have Georgie Simon's uh, bar and Tommy yeah. St. John's bar. But so, so what was it made one way to, to develop more parking? Do you remember? Like, yes, it, yes, it was because yeah. that's kind of what happens, right? So, like, how can we get more parking? And, you, and so you make it one way. That's what but you have. You do have a parking lot down there. Where, an IGA store you can make. You have parking behind Georgia Science. The store. Yeah, the town office. You would say. Uh, on, you know, I've served on the chamber board for a number of years. And the community has cried out and cried out merchants for two ways. They have. Because of drawing more business. You know, we keep talking about economic development. How many people go through Milwaukee right now that don't, never hit Florence Scott Avenue, never hit Main Street? Is that break through? Where if you had that, a lot of, a lot of your traffic would come down to that and I would make that loop down and go down Florence Scott Avenue or Main Street, whatever they want to call it. But just not. that's something that, that they've always talked about redoing because of the economic development for that. Is what that, changes would have to be made? Is it just a matter of repainting the? Not exactly. <laughs> the signal would have to change, uh, right? Yeah, but <laughs> I mean, are we talking about we've got to dig up Main Street now no. and widen it, or? No, no. it was two way. Yeah, so, oh, I remember so it. The physical, the physical sort of it's condition of it yeah. is set up for two way. Yeah. It's it's not other than the signal. It's not an expensive. Undertake it, paper marking signage. Um, no changes to but the signal. The signal actually could be, you know, um, hundred thousand ish, depending upon how you do it. And that's that's that'll be the more expensive part. Yes. Has any consideration? I personally, two ways. I have no problem with if the if the logistics of it can be worked out. And when I say logistics, I mean deliveries. UPS. FedEx people stopping on the street. If you go two way traffic and one lane is taken up by a double parked vehicle because that's the only way they can make the delivery on that street to a business or whatever, is that going to cause a traffic congestion or a problem? Cars trying to get out around from in crossing into the other lane. Uh, I just wonder if there's enough space for to accommodate delivery trucks parked along there trying to make deliveries along Canal Scott Avenue. Uh, it's, it, it, uh, to me, that would be the only the only drawback to it. You probably would have to develop, the, you know, um, uh, truck loading zones for deliveries. Some, you know, that's probably what you would do. Um, but again, that's something that we didn't look at. That would probably be looked at, you know, in, in the next step if there was some sense that it should be it should go forward. Charles, right, Mike? That would be an existing problem now. With the difference of the parking. If you really have a narrow lane, I, I understand what you mean, right? yeah. but if there's no traffic coming the other way, they pull up, go around. But if you do that at your, your suggestion of loading zones, yeah, loading then you're, now we're losing 60, you would lose some more parking. 20 to 24 parking would, spots. Yeah. If you make three or four yeah. of those in each of the. Yeah, I mean, I mean, communi communities get innovative and, and try to try to implement loading zones for certain times of days and then freeze it free up for parking other times of day there, there are ways to do it so you're not losing parking over the entire day so a lot of places have you know loading will happen early in the morning or other times of day again we don't look at that I, I don't i it's a legitimate issue that would have to get flushed out as the thing goes along how do you how do you how do you deal with delivery trucks and how do you how do you manage that curbside management would be part of it yes 
Is it me? That's you. <laughs> I'm going to press a little further. You said the town will decide. Does that mean the town council okay. will decide, or does it go to town referendum? Or I didn't quite get a full answer. Marty already made the OT. Um, this is a little bit different than a lot of DOT projects. A lot of times DOT has a public meeting when we're designing a bridge or something and we're going to say public meeting, these are the options we're looking at. Construction will start approximately a year from now. This was not a DOT initiated project. Um, as Jen, Jane mentioned, I don't know, maybe 14 months or so, um, Jane and Brittany and others approached Maine DOT about about this um, about the study or this need for connectivity, economic development, and then went through a process, funding. We collectively hired T. Y. Lynn and Tom. We kind of looked at the purpose statement that Tom looked at, and then options to bring this vision. And if you look at the detailed report, it lays out a bunch of different mechanisms to improve safety. Mm -hmm. and accessibility. It's not a one-size-fits-all. Millinock needs to choose to accept the whole report today and apply for funding. There's different options, and the one-way to two-way conversion is just a piece of that. So what kind of what happens next? This is our second public meeting. We had one in September. There's September and October. It was September. September. Um, and we heard some feedback. The final report will summarize this feedback, this feedback, and then we'll work with Peter and we'll work with, we'll work with the town and come back if kind of present options or discuss steps moving forward. If you really want to learn more about two-way conversion, then we can provide guidance, we can provide resources or next steps. And then if there's aspects of, pe of pieces that you want to move forward to design, we can then, on a case by case basis, <coughs> discuss various funding options. So, kind of like the, the immediate action is we've had this draft report that's on the web. We've received the feedback tonight. We'll continue to read feed, receive feedback to Peter until April 29th. Um, and then we'll summarize it in the report. And then so we'll basically work. goes to town council discussion. Yep. Yeah. No. Does it go mm -hmm. to town referendum? Or is it just town council decision? Well, all town council decisions are public. So we would certainly have the option for all sorts of public feedback there. But I don't imagine this would go to a referendum. Just to clarify, would be funding discussion, I would assume. We don't go to a referendum if citizen petition, but to overturn what the council did if they collect the signature and so forth. You know, I'd, like, I'd like to have um, Mark, um, Patrick, Marty, um, Marty, <laughs> Patrick talk about because we're, we're at phase two. I mean, this will complete the phase one, the, the sure. study, and then we have some engineering dollars that are coming out. Right? Sure. Before we get into the funding, can, can I read some of these comments sure. that have been waiting a moment? Big uh, up, big up. Okay. I'm going to turn over here. Uh, could you repeat? Uh, whether parking uh, on on a two-way Penobscot Avenue would be parallel on both sides, or was it parallel on left only with diagonal on the right? That would be parallel on both sides. Um, Foods and D'Alessandro says there was talk recently about wanting snowmobile access to Penobscot Avenue, where would they park? Um, we don't have an answer for that yet permanently, uh, but you know that is an ongoing discussion with the owners of Maine Heritage, Millinocket Heritage Park, which is uh, the plot of land on the corner of Penobscot and Central Street um, that could open up and be an option for snowmobile parking if that goes through. Stephanie Jameson adds, delivery trucks uh, go through the back alley behind businesses when, it, when applicable, um, maybe including uh, the current Main Street business owners and follow-up discussions 
regarding two lanes on that street would be a good next step. Thank you. We will take that into consideration. Back to Mark. No, back to Pat. <laughs> good evening, everyone. I'm Patrick Adams. I'm Main DOT's active transportation planner. So I work with communities across the state on bicycle and pedestrian issues. So I is okay to came to visit Jane and Mike. Like August of 2020. August of 2020. Early in the pandemic. That's all I could remember. Um, and they talked about their vision for the community, uh, about safety issues that they're concerned in. And I kind of directed them along this pathway for the study. So the study is all about identifying alternatives for the community and making recommendations about how to improve safety for pedestrians, how to improve safety for uh, bicyclists, and how to still maintain the drivability with vehicles in the community. We do know that by creating better facilities, by creating better sidewalks, we make it safer for people to walk around the community. And when it's safer and people feel more comfortable, people use it. And the same with bicycles. That's really what we're out for here. So the study is one piece. We also know that there was an interest in doing more than just talking about doing something. There was also a desire to do something about it. So about almost a, a little less than a year ago, uh, the town came forward with an interest in applying for grant. Uh, through Maine DOT. Maine DOT manages a bicycle pedestrian uh, improvement grant program, federal dollars, um, designed to really talk about improving facilities. We knew the study was going on at the same time. So we saw the grant cycle being a great opportunity for the municipality to apply for some funding not a lot of funding, but some funding to address some of that low hanging fruit. What were some of the things that we felt most members of the community would support and be interested in? And what could be uh, low cost implementation? So the town submitted an application last fall for funding, uh, mostly on Congress Street from forest to water if I remember. On that. Central. On Central, sorry. No. On Central Street. Uh, the town did get the funding, okay? Funding is an 80-20 under federal dollars. So uh, feds pay 80, town pays 20%. As of right now, DOT has allocated $75,000, 60,000 federal, 15,000 from the town to begin the design work the exact same thing you were asking Tom about. What are gonna be the specifics? That project is separate and distinct from this planning study. So these public meetings that you were talking about and wanting to have some input, that's what this process is all about. It's mostly about improving the sidewalk conditions. It's about improving the crossings and the safety, looking at uh, exploring, uh, getting the bike lanes through that corridor. It's really about trying within what I think of as really your downtown core, trying to improve the walkability and bikeability. We're probably looking, do you remember Tom, we we're talking about probably a total price tag of 350. Sounds right. It's a, I see a lot of these and I think that's the number we have here. So 350. Uh, for design and construction from start to finish, which would be about 70,000 from the town. Questions? Did I really do that well? Do you have no <laughs> questions? <laughs> Thank you. <Pat. laughs> Just go over the last number, like your last sentence. 315 is. I I believe our initial estimate to do all of the design work, including right of way work and construction for what we proposed, which was not 
all inclusive of the study, just this small little piece, which was kind of partial elements from within multiple segments was $350,000. At 80-20, that would be 70,000 from the town and 280,000 from the feds. Okay, that's more clear. And it's from Central Street to Forest Avenue. Is that what you said? Yes. No. 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 I tried to memorize it. Yeah. Okay. No, 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 no. Okay. Central Street between Forest and Congress. It's a really um, short well, section. Yeah. Yeah. I tried to remember to memorize it. And that, that section was focused on, I believe, because it was to, related to the uh, safe routes to school. You know, yeah. to get to get across Now, depending on what we do, I, I heard that's a lot of money. Yeah, it is a lot of money. Everything's costing for a lot of most areas. I just wanted to clarify that last sentence. Right. The reason we've allocated seventy five thousand right now is to figure out what that price honestly and truly would be. The last two years, we've seen 20 to 25% increases in prices. Mm -hmm. uh, sadly, it's, it's... So that part that you just described is going forward and that's separate from... Separate that from that. Yep. This is like, oh, sorry. This is like yeah. the next step forward. Right. Right. These are the ideas. My, the so grant that I manage is, is all forward. about... How do we start to think? And, and it's and it's mostly like Patrick was saying, sidewalk yeah. improvements, right? Bring it up. We're talking about that ADA compliance, yeah. so that so that it's accessible for everybody. It's really about doing a lot of that. that part, replacing part the part replacing the sidewalks themselves, and then improving those crossings and the crossings, and, which also includes some of the hardware involved. That I believe mm -hmm. there, right? mm -hmm. to get the pedestrian crossing safe. Mm -hmm. Can I, I'll just add a little bit more because I was part of the grant writing process. So this, the inspiration. So this is the <laughs> so these this is really the this is baby steps. Mm -hmm. it, and you heard him say how expensive it was. Mm -hmm. And so we had to pick a portion of the study area because we hear it all the time. The rest of the sidewalks in the town, we know they need to be addressed. And that's all there's Ralph has addressed that for us, and there's some planning in place, and we have to we have to figure out when that can happen. But everything this is grant funded based on the study that the grant was funded to do. And so it's picking up, and we also had to write the grant around we needed to commit connectivity to the schools. It was it was a safe schools, some funding. So that's why, because grants, you know, the is that um Water Street was the yeah. that's your water. Water Street to the backside, oh, Granite yeah, Street, and then Sturz High School. So yeah. that's really like Congress Street to Earth, or is it Ash Street? No, Ash Street. I'm sorry, I got it. Yeah, so it's a very short section, but it's really to improve like ADA access in the in the um in the sidewalks, like they said. So it's a Grand Street at dismissal time. So it's so it's a start, <laughs> and then the conversation is going to go on about what the rest of the that might look like over time. It, it's this is just proposal something to think about mm -hmm. it's a lot of planning and then mm -hmm. fundraising and going after grants but there's lots of funds out there so we need to be prepared mm -hmm. and i thank the dot for all their partnership and their help and their steering us in the right direction t one you've been great to work with so i thank you any other uh questions comments sarcastic remarks so so basically we're, we're talking about Mass Avenue to Katahdin Avenue on Central Street. Is this one project or is this uh this is likely many small bites at a big goal if we are to move forward? Again, these are ideas and suggestions at this point. Uh, you know, it'll take a lot more conversation at the down level with, you know, with the community and, you know, looking at the funding sources as well uh, about what we can, what, which piece we can bite off at a time uh, if we ultimately choose collectively to move forward. And some of it's prioritizing what, 
what do you feel are the most important places for things to happen? Are you prioritizing youth safety? Are you prioritizing <coughs> economic development? Are you prioritizing uh, health walking in neighborhoods? There are lots of different opportunities and lots of different priorities. And this study addressed many, many different elements. It's not, we don't live here. It's not up to us to tell you this is what you need to do. This is, this is a local decision and we're here as, as a tool or as a resource to help you make those decisions. I think number one is publicizing when the meetings happen. I mean, this meeting was in the paper. That's why I'm here, but they're not always publicized or announced. I think you'll find that that has changed uh, in recent months, and um, all meetings are very well publicized and here uh, at this point. Uh, so you know, we will we'll be on social media, we'll be in the newspaper, we'll be you know putting it anywhere we can uh, to encourage folks to come. You know, this these are not decisions or conversations to be had in small groups. Uh, these are certainly things we want to engage the community members on. And, and you know, gather their feedback to help make the decision. So they will be very highly advertised moving forward. I, I can tell you, I'm pleased with the turnout. I mean, this, you know, in terms of studies and work we do, this is this is a good turnout. Good turnout. Right. One other comment, and I've learned tonight that this is a little bit separate, or is separate, but maybe it's Ralph and maybe Jane. But last summer, the crosswalk signs that were put in the street, they, <clears throat> I think they were trying to solve one problem, but create another problem for drivers. Um, they were kind of a danger. They were out in the street too far, and they weren't always visible if you could put maybe neon tape on them to make them more visible. So they had seen, they were just too white and then in the road too far. I know they would maybe that light line colored neon, but I think they were dangerous You're as a driver. To the pedestrian crossing ones that we put, they have to be in the center of the road. Yeah. Well, some of them were from the side of the road, but out yeah, in the, the to the edge and they were out just a little too uh, far. And sometimes the even on survive. Central Street, they were out yeah. to the side of the road. Yeah. She's yeah. referring to the uh, she's by, by coalition of mayor. Project oh, talking about, talking about the, imagine you were here. Yeah, those are people, those are people. Those, those posts are supposed to represent people standing there. <laughs> They were, they were in the <laughs> Yeah, so it was Imagine People Here um, project, demonstration project. So that means it was a temporary project and it is around, you know, to create awareness about safety. Imagine if somebody was, yeah, imagine if somebody was here. But they do, um, precise, I say, precise measurements on where those should be. It's not just like willy nilly, that sort of thing. So we had that first round of them. We got lots of community feedback. We're going to take that feedback because it's actually a two season project. They're looking to come, they're looking to work with us again um, this spring summer and see what worked last time to continue to try it again and if there's an aspect of each one we needed we're not going to do it I know there's some that we know we're not but it did um, it did do what we kind of needed it to do it created a lot of conversation around it slowed people slowed traffic down a lot of different um, yeah so we don't, we don't want to create problems that's not that was not the intent absolutely not the intent that's like this on the center I thought you meant the yeah. pedestrian cross and ones that we put in the center no. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we're coming to a close here. Uh, I want to very much thank everybody who uh, joined us for this meeting. This was a great turnout, more than I expected, uh, and I am very pleased with that. I hope that we grow in numbers as we continue to talk about this stuff. Um, and you know, those online as well, uh, thank you for logging in and, and uh, being part of the discussion. Thank you, T.Y. Lynn and Maine DOT for joining us in person. Uh, it was a great feeling to be, you know, in person and doing this. Um, please know that the recording of this meeting will be available on YouTube, um, very likely by tomorrow. Uh, and the presentation 
um, and the study will be available um, on our website as well. Uh, you can uh, put together any thoughts, feedback, or further questions and send them to me at manager at millinocket.org. Call me at the town office. You can talk to me about this stuff. Um, let's keep the conversation going. Um, and thank you all for coming. Thank you. 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 Thank you.